Society has undeniably seen great benefits from the arrival of the information age. The internet and social media have eliminated geographical barriers and enabled the free flow of ideas, connecting us in ways that were impossible a mere generation ago. But these technologies are also being used to spread hate and confusion and to enable and broadcast some of humanity's most sinister and antisocial behaviors. It just went too far and like something that should absolutely never happen, that will never happen again. He's a great kid, and I would never want to hurt anyone. And I will absolutely resign from teaching. I've ruined my career, my marriage. i ruined everything I've worked hard for in my life. I am 100% willing to be open and honest with you about everything. I just am scared that it's being recorded, and I'm scared that it's going to be like played in the court where I'm going to go to jail for the rest of my life. In the spring of 2018, elementary school teacher Brittany Zamora captured America's attention. You have all of the things that make for good entertainment, an attractive teacher, sexual misconduct. Just one more on the long list of young, attractive teachers who threw their life away to pursue a sexual relationship with an adolescent. She was 27, he was 13, and in sixth grade. It was just a case that was just so sensational and it was so salacious. The second you see that mugshot released and her name and age, it just blew up. Once the Goodyear Police Department started releasing evidence, the story went viral. The evidence just kept being released because you had the text messages, you had the video interviews with the victim, hearing in his own words what happened to him. And then you have the confrontation calls. Zamora's misconduct may not have come to light had it not been for Sentry, a smartphone app. It's essentially a monitoring app that flags certain words and conversations. The Sentry app flagged the usage of the word baby multiple times. At first, they thought, oh, he must have a girlfriend. The boy told his parents that he was having a sexual relationship with his teacher. They didn't believe it. And so his father said, show me. So he got on Instagram and messaged her in a sexually explicit way. And she messaged him back. Zamora took the bait, confirming the boy's accusations. Shortly after, the concerned parents confronted Zamora and notified the police. What type of f perverted person are you? I want to know right now. Why do you say that? You are a monster. You are a pedophile. You're a child molester. Do you understand me? On March 22, 2018, Brittany Zamora was arrested and charged with eight counts of sexual conduct with a minor. When you meet him and you see what he's like, you know, it really raises questions. Like, what kind of relationship could this 27-year-old woman have had with this sixth grade boy? What was the emotional payoff in this relationship for her? Professor David McLeod studies criminal behavior and is a leading expert in female sex offenders. Most people who sexually offend have a history of their own trauma and abuse, particularly in early childhood. I am the first person in my family to graduate or do something with their life. Like, I was known as, oh, like, for once, like, we don't have a screw-up kid. This has a really specific impact on their ability to form appropriate, healthy relationships. My mind, my head, not in the right place. They lose a sense of morality in regards to what is appropriate and what the needs of the other individual are. And they're willing to cross those lines in order to fill that void inside them that's longing for connection and intimacy. It, it was not, you know, all me. I am the adult. Like, it wasn't forced upon. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want you to think, like, I 
like forced him or anything like that because I would never, never do that. Male offenders are more likely to be convicted of things like forcible rape, whereas female type offenses tend to be less physically violent and more manipulative. The manipulation often starts months in advance. I believe they conversed for two or three months before the first time there was ever even any physical contact. Zamora started the grooming process in the classroom shortly after the school year began. As early as September of 2017, she was already reaching out to the family and she actually approached the parents and said, oh, I love your son. I'd love to come over to your house if he ever needs tutoring. We need to learn how to tackle. She was trying to work her way into this family's home. But Samora had a secret online life with a student as well. And this is where a lot of the grooming actually took place. You look at other notable teacher cases, they're meeting outside of class all the time. With the victim and Zamora, they were able to build their entire relationship through digital communication before ever taking it to a physical level. The communication originally started an online app that the schools use called Classcraft. She had asked them to communicate with her via the app because she was gonna be bored, and he began talking to her, and then it escalated from there. Eventually, Zamora moved the communication away from Classcraft and onto Instagram Messenger. Obviously, that was to get it out from the school's radar. In December, the relationship became physical and escalated over the next two months. The relationship started with just a kiss in class, but it quickly escalated from there. They met outside of the victim's grandparents' house and uh, had oral sex in the car one night. And then the next night, they came back and they very briefly had sex. They later had sex in the classroom while a friend stayed and served as a lookout. Zamora is essentially having a very graphic and adult relationship with this kid. The hot for teacher trope is still alive and well on the internet. I think that as a culture, we envision that there's a possibility this is some sort of sexual liberation for the young person that this woman is leading them into. Um, that's part of our fetish story or part of the trope. I mean, the way that he talked about things, you can definitely tell he's very advanced for his age. On the part of the offender and the victim, they almost always believe that this is a very consensual, quasi-healthy interaction. I, and I asked him, you know, I asked him all the time, like, how do you, how do you know this stuff? Like, I don't know, I just know. Like, that's, you know, that's so advanced for a 13 year old. The trope that we listen to is that this is some fun experience for the young man. But what we're not paying attention to is that this young person has been groomed in a really strong emotional, psychological way. And that when the unhealthiness of this relationship manifests and they finally see that, they're going to have some really significant psychological and emotional problems with relationships potentially for the rest of their life. In the end, this experience did cause problems for the student. He and his family have been uprooted from their community. His lawyer also says he's been battling depression and anxiety. Negative events have the staying power in our brain at a rate close to 10 times what positive events do. We fixate on how we messed up. Brittany Zamora's case never went to trial. In June of 2019, she pleaded guilty to criminal sexual conduct with a minor, attempted molestation, and public sexual indecency. So she took a stipulated plea deal um, where she received 20 years in prison. Brittany Zamora was a teacher. She was supposed to be the adult in the room, and there's no excuse. A 13-year-old can't seduce an adult. After she's released in her mid-40s, she'll be on probation for the rest of her life and she'll be required to register as a sex offender. There was some satisfaction from the parents that she would be well past childbearing age at that point. downtown for a birthday party with some of my closest friends and decided to get a lift because we're intoxicated. We got a lift and we took it to Maple Grove, the lift driver. Overheard us talking. I lived in like Fridley and he said he's on his way back home. If I wanted to ride home for free, I took it. He just seemed like he was just helping out 
on our way, he started asking questions like, is the party over? Do you want to drink anymore? I have liquor in my glove compartment. Do you want to taste? I felt like kind of sick. He stopped the car. He started to touch me, taking off some of my clothes. And that's where he tried to like get on me and things like that. Later on, when the cops went through his car, they found the new tequila bottle, but there's like two packs of Dixie cups, one that was already open, and then a condom. So I definitely think he did it before to somebody else. As children, we are taught to be cautious of all strangers. Don't speak to them. Don't get into a car with them. It's ingrained in us. And yet, rideshare companies have turned that paradigm onto its head. For some reason, because this reputable company is telling us it's safe, we're almost forgetting anything we've ever been told before about getting into cars with strangers. Being in a car with a stranger is one of the most unsafe places that you can be. You're captive. The more time that you spend doing that, the more likely it is that something's going to go wrong. With tens of millions of rides a day, companies like Uber and Lyft boast that 99.9% .9 of their rides go without incident. But with so many drivers on the road, day in and day out, that small fraction of a percent translates into thousands and thousands of painful experiences. In recent years, the safety standards of rideshare companies have come under scrutiny. In 2019, Uber released a detailed report addressing the public safety concerns, providing data about crimes committed by both drivers and passengers. They outlined close to 6,000 sexual assaults that had happened in a two-year period, taking into account that roughly one in three women report their assault. They compare it to how it's lower than national statistics or rapes and sexual assaults in general, but when you take into account that it's happening on a platform and it's a company that's putting two people together, I think that that completely changes the equation. Kristen Barton and her law firm contend that rideshare companies aren't doing enough to protect their passengers. They represent 38 victims of sexual assault, have filed five lawsuits against Lyft and one against Uber. Jane Roe, too, is one of the complainants. This is her story. I'm a very in control person. I was actually out for dinner. I had a couple of drinks and they hit me so hard. I don't drink and drive and I ordered a Lyft to get home because I thought that was safer than driving myself. I got into the car, I was a little bit stressed out, and I remember him specifically saying to me, you look like a very sad girl. I felt very weird at that point. I'm paying for this ride, just to get me home. It was about an eight mile drive. I had too much to drink and I put my head down and I fell asleep in the back of the car. Going down the highway, like two exits before he was to get off, he reached his hand back and I, froze and I'm like what's going on I kind of brushed his hand off he did it again he was able to take his hands and get them into my pants and that's when I started to panic I'm in a vehicle that's moving I can't jump out of the car my life flashed before my eyes then I, I decided to fight back so I jumped over the front seat and I strangled him we had an altercation in the car we were fighting he pulled over dragged me out of the car he got away, but he had my phone, I had my laptop, I had my, like, all my personal belongings, and he threw them out of his the vehicle, uh, ran over them multiple times, and left me in the middle of a dark street. Rideshares have become our generation's designated drivers. Both Tykesia Hall and Jane Roe too were intoxicated when they ordered their lift, believing it to be the safer option. Instead, they found themselves alone with men, willing to take advantage of their vulnerable condition. I think getting a job with Uber and Lyft is the perfect option for predators. I've called it before a devil's playground. You can pick the hours that you want to work. You know, I'm going to work at 2 a.m. and I'm going to pick up the drunk girl. It's just the two of you in that car. You could do whatever you want in that time because no one's going to ever see it. 
Every time we order a rideshare, we literally put our lives in the hands of a stranger. Why do we have faith that this person we know nothing about will get us safely to our destination? We're assuming that companies that have this much revenue, that clearly you're doing a good background check, you're not gonna put me in a car with someone who would ever do anything to me. But that might not be the case. Harry Campbell is a rideshare expert. His platform is the most popular resource for Lyft and Uber drivers. Uber and Lyft, I sometimes joke that all you need to get approved is to pass a background check and have a pulse. In the vast array of jobs, it's kind of considered low-wage work. Their biggest competition for labor is McDonald's. Brian Greening is the co-founder of Legal Rideshare. His firm represents drivers and passengers in lawsuits against rideshare companies. For rideshare, there is almost no accountability at the beginning. You have to establish that you have a driver's license and that your background check clears, and then you can get on the road and start driving passengers. I mean, no background check should take less than three days, and some of these drivers are applying and finding out within hours that they've been approved. They're not live scan or biometric background checks, so you're really not getting a full picture of who the driver is. Some people use other people's driver's license. There should be fingerprints. There should be an interview with somebody at headquarters because you can tell a lot about somebody, even if it's over the phone. If the base safety features were met at the outset, I don't think that we would be having the same type of problems that we're having now. The system has flaws. In 2019, London's Transportation Authority took action against Uber after identifying what they call the pattern of failures that placed passengers at risk. The city of London removed Uber's permit to operate because they found that 14,000 trips happened where basically the driver who picked up the passenger wasn't who they said they were. In September 2020, a judge ruled that Uber had adequately addressed the regulator's concerns and they were granted an 18-month license to operate. For Kristen Barton and her firm and the legal rideshare team, they see themselves as an integral part in shaping the future of rideshare. In terms of safety, they're playing catch up. You know, a lot of the safety changes that have been made in the past are in reaction to lawsuits that have been filed and because of bad publicity that they're getting. For their part, both Uber and Lyft have adopted new measures to improve their safety standards. Adding in app features like the new emergency button and banners that help passengers verify their driver's identity, as well as new standards for background checks. We are big fans of rideshare. It's the now and the future in terms of how we're getting around. That said, steps can be taken to make it safer. We're certainly not trying to say that, that rideshare shouldn't exist, but it should be safe. When we're dealing with billion dollar companies and some of the most innovative companies in the world, they need to be taking measures to ensure that they're pairing safe drivers with safe passengers, and there needs to be accountability, there needs to be safety mechanisms, and we're almost there, but they need to take that extra step. For most passengers, rideshares are safe. 99.9% .9 of all rides will end without incident. But for the victims of sexual assault, those rides leave lasting scars. Because it's such a small percentage, they're not investing the time and the energy, but that small percentage is causing such destruction to people's lives that people who are going through this got to say like, look, this is happening because the only way these companies are gonna stop is if the problem's big enough in their eyes. We're coming after you to fix this and to make sure that if you have it software, make sure that it's being used for good because evil is creeping in. You gotta stop that. through a divorce and I came across this young lady on the internet that took care of her mother and she presented herself to be as lonely as I was, if not more. At first there was flirting, after that there was affection. Two weeks.
weeks into it, we started saying I love you back and forth. First time she asked for money, her mother needed medication. Second time in the hospital. Then she said her mother was gonna die and she needed $10,000. Cyber scams are siphoning off trillions of dollars from the global economy, and there is little anyone can do about it. Most of the perpetrators are overseas, living in places like Nigeria, Ghana, and India, where American authorities lack jurisdiction. There are over 2,000 new scam victims being created every single day. It's just shocking how many people are falling for these things and how many people are losing their fortunes and their life savings. Sometimes the scammers are a couple of guys huddled around a laptop, and sometimes they are a sophisticated criminal enterprise. The Nigerian cartels have grown in wealth and influence. These are organizations that are gigantic in size. Recently, two individuals were arrested in Nigeria with a billion dollars in cash in the bank. The mindset for people over there is that we in America, we're all wealthy, we have plenty to lose. If, if we were to lose something, our government's gonna take care of us anyway. The reality is these scams ruin lives, and once the money is sent, it is gone. Of all the scams, the romance scam might be the most insidious. Because the nature of the crime is not only financial, it is emotional. My mother told me that her friend had met somebody in the military on Facebook looking for a relationship. She was in love. This gentleman loved her. He was going to come spend the rest of his life with her. Kathy Waters helped found an advocacy group aimed at protecting consumers from online romance scams. He had a uniform on and it had his name right here and it said Denny. Well, my mother's friend said this gentleman's name was Ross Newton. So I looked up army man Denny online and I found Brian. Her partner, Brian Denny, has been the victim of identity theft, and his images are being used to scam women out of their money all over the world. Kathy and I counted thousands upon thousands upon thousands. We're at the over 3,000 fake profiles reported that are just on me, and a lot of those are still up and active. Brian has had to break up with somebody almost every week. I get five to ten messages a week from people I don't know on Messenger three a week that say, hey, I've been talking to someone who says they're you. I've given them money and we have plans to be together and I need to know what's going on. And you're fixing to really tell them something that's going to be painful. The scammers chose Brian specifically because of his military background, an ideal cover story to hide behind. They use the military a lot because people trust our military. The men and women are out there giving their lives. These people want to give back. They will create these accounts and say, I'm a soldier overseas and I'm looking for an online relationship. And people fall for these things because it's easy for them to say, oh, I can't come see you in person or I can't talk on the phone because I'm under such rules. I'm in a different country. I'm only able to text. The storyline works and it's been effective. My friend, over the three month span, sent over a total of $35,000 to the scammer. He manipulated her and swindled her out of money for an airline ticket, a down payment for a home, and money to help his son in boarding school. Dr. Tim McGinnis, the founder of SCARS, a nonprofit organization that works with romance scam victims, has been studying cyber crimes for years. Scam victims are to blame only for one aspect, is that initial contact and conversation. Once it gets started, the scammer has control of the situation and it will follow a predictable course. Debbie Montgomery Johnson recently lost her husband when she met her scammer on an online dating site. I was contacted by a man, he was 55, he was a widower, very good looking, and he said he was from London. I thought that's kind of interesting, an international businessman. Debbie herself was a sophisticated businesswoman who now ran both her and her husband's businesses. With a military intelligence background, she is not who you would expect to be victimized by online scammers. Romance scams take long-term grooming. It's a highly manipulative crime. These scammers get into these victims' minds. From the onset, Debbie scammer Eric knew how to prime her. Eric was a comfort. He knew what to say. He made me laugh. He made me feel valuable as a woman, as a business partner, as a mom. 
Eric became her boyfriend, and all the feelings of a new relationship surfaced. I would hear that ding, ding, ding of the Yahoo chat when he was trying to get a hold of me. I could be sound asleep and I would run into my office. It was like you're, you're young dating again. It was very fun. Debbie even began socializing with Eric's friends and family. He had a sister, she was a, a widow, and his son. And so I got to know them. Uh, there were times when I would have three instant message chats going, one with him, one with his sister and son, and one with his attorney. The whole thing was a family affair. But there was no family. They tend to work in teams of anywhere from three, four, to as many as 16. It was a coordinated group, playing roles and methodically shaping her beliefs. They use a technique known as gaslighting. The victim is systematically manipulated to change their perception of reality. Over time, he became my family, and I wanted to help him out as if I would be helping anybody in my family. You might be able to get money as early as one to two weeks, and typically it starts with very small payments. He wanted another friend of his to get online, so he asked me to send a check for about $45, which I did. And the scammer will then begin a process of professional grade manipulation. We're talking Soviet era spycraft manipulation. Then the next time was $2,500. The next one might have been 10,000. The largest amount was maybe 50,000 or 100,000. It was all based on, I'll get it back within a few weeks. Scammers use techniques on individuals to get them to do things that they wouldn't have even considered a month or two previously. I'd given him a lot of money and I kept thinking this is the last transfer, this is it. And he would tell me that this is it. If I had ever had a thought that it was a scam, I'm like, well, I'm so far into this that I had to see it through. And once you break the will to start sending money, greater confidence typically ensues and the magnitudes and the amounts get larger until Romance scam victims especially will send scammers virtually everything that they have. Altogether, it was $1,080,762. Yeah, over $1 million. For so many people, that would have been it. The end of the road. Scam victims go through an incredible range of extremely powerful emotions when the scam is realized. They end up not only losing their money, but they lose someone that they thought that they were legitimately in love with. Once they find out, it is like a mourning. The person's no longer in their life, it's like they died. The real tragedy is that people who have given away everything don't have any place to turn or are mortified that they've done this and they take their own life. About 12 to 20 individuals take their life every single day as a result of romance scam. Debbie Montgomery Johnson was one of the lucky ones. She was able to bounce back and gain control of her life. She attributes some of her resilience to the fact that Eric eventually confessed. He came online one morning and he, he asked me how I felt about forgiveness. And then he said, Deb, I have a confession to make. This has all been a scam. And I'm thinking, you're lying. And that's what he said on Yahoo chat, there's a little camera and I'm gonna come online and I'm expecting to see this handsome Brit. And up pops the little camera and I see a brown-haired, brown-eyed, brown-skinned young man with a huge smile on his face. I'm really grateful that he did that because it gave me closure over time. Debbie has made it her mission to speak out and help other victims. I just felt that by telling my story, if I could help one woman recover or save one woman from getting involved, then that's what I was supposed to learn from this. But the problem is the vast majority of online scams go unreported. Only about three to five percent of victims actually report these to federal authorities. And the victims suffer in silence. It is the unbelievable shame that comes from allowing themselves to be, to be duped and scammed, but they didn't allow it to happen. It simply happened beyond their control. They were dealing with a manipulator that was vastly more expert than they were. It started when Brandon posted a picture of Bianca's body to Discord as well as his Instagram story. She was like next level artistic. She was next level beautiful. And she was like really radiant and glowing. Bianca Devins was trending on Twitter. From there, it started running to 4chan, to 8chan, to Reddit. It went viral instantly. People just start taking it and spreading it and it goes farther and farther. 
I don't think that anyone really knows like how strong of an aura and a presence that she was. His choices to make it so public caught everyone's attention. I always told her, I'm like, you're gonna be famous. On the morning of July 14th, 2019, thousands of people gathered on the streets of Utica, New York, preparing for the annual Boilermaker Road Race. The weather was nice, it was a beautiful day out. This was Utica's biggest event of the entire year. So everybody out in the city of Utica, they're all gathering out at this starting line. And a couple blocks away, suddenly everyone starts hearing about a big police presence. Around 7 a.m., emergency dispatchers received several calls claiming that a man had committed a murder and posted graphic pictures of his victim on social media. At approximately 7.20, the murderer himself called 911. It was one of the weirdest 911 calls I've heard in my career. He was very cool and collected. He tells them something like, I can't stay on the phone very long. I have to go commit the suicide part of a murder-suicide. At one point, the dispatcher asks him for a callback number, and he says something like, don't call me back, you're gonna f up my suicide photo. Police tracked the call to a wooded area off of Poe Street in Utica. There, they found the body of a young woman and a 21-year-old Brandon Clark, phone in hand, attempting to live stream his own suicide. From what the police have told us, he was live streaming, cutting his own throat. A standoff ensued. And once more officers arrived, they were able to detain the injured man and save his life. The following day, Brandon Clark was officially charged with the murder of Bianca Devins. She was 17, and she had her whole life ahead of her. The story went viral almost immediately. The minute Brandon Clark posted the pictures of Bianca's body on social media, it was copied, shared, and dispersed across the internet. Online forums became hotbeds for speculation as people tried to figure out what happened that night. I couldn't make sense of all these different armchair internet sleuths who think they had all the information, so I couldn't tell, you know, what was right, what was just gossip, what was people embellishing. In the end, the story was simpler than it seemed. The two of them had been talking online. Police have called them boyfriend and girlfriend. Family members have said that it wasn't as serious as that, that maybe it was only Brandon who thought that. It was more like Brandon had a crush on Bianca and Bianca didn't feel the same way. Bianca looked at him as more of a friend. That's why she trusted him that night to drive her to the concert. They went to a concert in Queens. They met up with a third party there, another guy. Clark saw Bianca kissing this other guy. Brandon went from thinking this might be a date to I'm the third wheel. Brandon and Bianca went to a local Denny's. They were there for about an hour. Whatever happened at that Denny's is what escalated the situation because it was just a few hours later when he posted that picture of her body on Instagram. Part of the reason her story went viral was because she already had a big digital footprint. Bianca had multiple social media accounts. She had multiple Instagrams. She had multiple Twitters. She had multiple blogs and Discord accounts. There was more than enough materials for onlookers to speculate about. You know, she was popular online. She spoke openly. She had a sense of humor. She was pretty. She garnered attention. It's no wonder Brandon liked her. I always knew the profile that said girl. I didn't know the one that said fake internet girl. I didn't know her, her online life. I just knew her. May was Bianca's mentor and friend. She was helping Bianca navigate the beginning of a promising modeling career. You know, even though she wanted to pursue a degree in psychology, she could have paid for her college through modeling. We became really close because we did like photo shoots and wanted to go to the city together. She was like next level artistic. She was next level beautiful and like really radiant and glowing. I don't think that anyone really knows like how strong of an aura and a presence that she was. I'm hard to impress and she impressed me. In life, Bianca had a sizable following on social media. 
In death, she became famous, but not for what her friends and family want her remembered for. Her parents have fought really hard to get the murder images taken down. Obviously, it's their daughter's last moment, so they don't want to have that available for anybody. Unfortunately, many of the graphic images still exist on social media sites today. Plenty of people probably saved it, and plenty of people shared it elsewhere. Anyone at any time could re-upload it. That kind of picture would never die. That's just how these corners of the internet work. It's very sick to think that someone would want their family member's death relived, and that's part of the fight to get these images removed. trafficked pretty much every day from when I was age 10 to age 14. They weren't worried about being caught. They had almost an arrogance about them. I was given different substances to kind of placate me in the beginning and then to keep me from fighting back when I got older. I wasn't taking them consensually. We just remove ourselves from the situation mentally, floating away from your body. The Human Trafficking Hotline estimates that between 18 and 20,000 people are trafficked in the United States every year, and roughly 25% of them are children sold for sex. A lot of people think it doesn't happen near them. They think it happens in big cities or completely different countries when it's happening everywhere all across America all the time. At 10 years old, Haile Gregg was forced into the horrors of sex trafficking, not by some nefarious criminal organization in a big city, but by a family in the American heartland. It was a very small farming community in rural Ohio. The average graduating class of their high school is like 25 people. For four years, she was brought to strangers' houses, cheap motels, and truck stops, and sold to hundreds upon hundreds of men. Is they assume that the way people get involved in sex trafficking is that they're picked up in these white vans, just swooped off the side of the street and totally kidnapped and held in the basement of some guy's house. And that's just not how it happens. Tori Lowe is a community activist in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. When he's not protesting police violence or confronting gangs, he is rescuing teenage girls from traffickers. I'm by request. I only go after human trafficking when it's somebody under 18. I have on record 187 rescues. In 2018, Tori gained public notoriety for his role in saving a 16-year-old girl from an alleged sex trafficking ring. The girl had been missing from Milwaukee for a month when her frustrated parents asked Tori for help. My name is Bonnie. Um, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm here in Chicago right now with Tori Lowe. We are looking for my daughter. She's been missing for over a month. Using the power of social media, Tori was able to enlist the help of his followers. If anybody has any information, please contact the family or the police department. It wasn't long before the tips came in, the critical one being a Facebook Live post. The video was made by the alleged sex traffickers. The people who had had her thought that it was cool to put what they were doing to her on the internet. Community awareness was what ultimately saved the young girl. She was rescued 100 miles from her home in Chicago. I didn't wait for the politicians. I didn't wait for the police. We can bring the results ourselves. These are our children. We should get directly involved and try to solve these issues. Tori Lowe also warns parents that human traffickers are using social media to contact and groom potential victims. Social media is like a weapon in human trafficking because these girls can be sitting there on TikTok, on Snapchat, on Facebook, on Instagram, talking to predators in the house next to their parents. You should not let your child get on the internet without monitoring who she's talking to. Tori has seen this tactic used more and more throughout his community. In order for them to get lured away into the lifestyle, they have to want certain things. They go after children or people with needs, people who need housing or need food or just need love, and they're not getting it from other places. It makes them susceptible to this type of abuse. 
and it makes it easy to groom them. It's not complicated, but people want things and they can't get them and somebody offers it to them. Statistically, sex traffickers seek to exploit vulnerable populations, children in foster care, runaways, drug addicts, victims of abuse. I was vulnerable for a number of reasons. I was molested really early in life. I didn't always have a secure place to sleep or I didn't always know where my next meal was coming from. I just didn't have a parental figure to rely on. And all of these things kind of created a perfect storm that made me so much more susceptible to this type of abuse than another kid might be. For Kylie, the grooming was a drawn out, meticulous process, specifically designed to make her a prisoner of her own mind. These things don't start out abusive. They're often wonderful relationships where you're kind of pampered, you're taken care of. They treated me like I was family until I trusted them. And then the exploitation began very slowly so I wouldn't like freak out and run away. Because I was so young and because of my early life experiences, I honestly was like, okay, this is normal. This is just what it means to be a member of a family. This is what it means to be loved. This is just how things are. The United States has long been a leader at fighting human trafficking around the world. Unfortunately, we have often fallen short when it comes to dealing with it in our own country. In 2012, President Obama addressed this issue. Trafficking also goes on right here in the United States. For the first time at Hillary's direction, our annual trafficking report now includes the United States. Because we can't ask other nations to do what we are not doing ourselves. Congress has since passed legislation designed to combat human trafficking domestically, in part by disrupting how sex work has been advertised online. As a consequence, in April of 2018, federal agencies seized the notorious website Backpage.com. Backpage was the leading site for commercial sex promotion. The legislation has had some unintentional consequences for the victims of sex trafficking. Those ads were all leads for law enforcement. They were either leads for criminal activity or they were leads for rescuing sex trafficking victims. Now there's ads all over the place. Law enforcement stopped shooting the fish in the barrel back page, and they have now had to redeploy their resources towards walking the streets. Now they're rescuing fewer sex trafficking victims. Underage sex trafficking victims are some of the most marginalized people in our society. The details of their lives may vary, but the vast majority of them will go untold and forgotten. Unfortunately, when these victims turn 18, they are far more likely to be arrested for prostitution than to be treated for the trauma forced upon them. Kylie Gregg was barely a teenager when she was forced into the horrors of sex trafficking. The fact that she was sold to hundreds upon hundreds of adult men must be recognized and seriously contemplated. I don't think that many of these men thought of themselves as evil or monsters. They all seemed pretty relaxed and pretty at peace with what they were doing. I think a lot of that comes from how normalized violence is in our culture, how normalized it is to be attracted to younger girls. Underage sex work is a consistent problem in America. It might be time to ask why so many men think it is acceptable to pay money to rape an underage girl. We have a huge pedophile problem in America that people just don't want to talk about because it makes them uncomfortable, but we're not going to solve anything if we're not willing to talk about it. knows what a pandemic is right now. A virus can spread across the world and make people sick. There's also another threat, this infodemic, false and misleading misinformation that is traveling just as fast as the virus, infecting people's minds and making individuals follow harmful advice. 
In the US, over 60% of American citizens believe at least one piece of misinformation that they saw on social media. Take, for example, a story claiming to be from the Stanford Health Institute and telling people that if you can hold your breath for 10 seconds, you don't have COVID-19. That post had reached millions of views and was shared tens of thousands of times. I imagine a woman sees this, holds her breath for 10 seconds, and goes to visit her mother and gets her sick at a nursing home. You could see the dominoes of that. It's putting the lives of whole communities at risk. Back in February of 2020, before the coronavirus spread across the globe, the director general of the World Health Organization warned of another danger. We're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. Fake news spreads faster and more easily than this virus and is just as dangerous. Fadi Quran is a campaign director for Avaz, an online civic movement organizing communities to take action on pressing global issues. They have over 62 million members worldwide. The moment that we began hearing about the epidemic in China, we asked members across the world to begin sharing with us what type of information they were seeing on social media, both from Twitter, from YouTube, from Facebook, Instagram. A lot of people have this assumption that the misinformation is largely just ignorant people posting ignorant stuff on social media. That's very often not the case. It's usually the case that you have actors with a specific goal meant to cause harm who are designing this content to hurt a specific subset of people. For example, one story was that if you have black skin, you're immune to the virus. On one hand, it could be that a racist actor wanted to spread that to make African Americans more prone to the virus. On the other hand, foreign actors such as Russia sometimes seek to use racial divisions. Why would a country like Russia or like China want to push those types of narratives? The US, if it's your target, will be weaker it will have the pandemic for longer. And it benefits you on the international stage as well, because you look like a stable, effective nation, whereas the country that you're competing with looks weak. Certain political actors also benefit from misinformation. If you have a certain topic that your party doesn't want to deal with, the easiest thing to do is to just blast social media with misinformation, use fake accounts and other means to ensure it reaches millions, and suddenly you're defining the political debate. As the pandemic rages on in America, it's clear that our nation's response has been inadequate. Fadi Quran helps shed light on how the infodemic contributes to the problem. The communities that believe misinformation were 25% less likely to follow basic health advice, such as washing your hands and wearing a mask and so forth. And the impact that has on the pandemic could be exponential. Researchers from the University of Cornell found that between 14 and 19% of Americans saw and believed misinformation about the pandemic. That is twice as many people that saw and believed misinformation during the 2016 election. So why are more people believing misinformation now? Trust in authority is very low right now, and there's these great avenues for getting information from non-experts like social media platforms, and so it's confusing to know who to trust. Helen Kapstein is a mass hysteria expert. She thinks the scope of the global pandemic might be a factor. Everything about it is hard to grasp. It's terrifying. This is partly a question of scale. The nature of a pandemic is that it's everywhere, and that's practically unfathomable. We're so much more vulnerable in a time like this than we would normally be, because we're all legitimately very scared, and therefore we're all more prone to buying into ideas that we might otherwise be a little bit more immune to. Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus. This is their new hoax. The divided nature of American politics is also playing its part. When the president of the United States said that this virus was part of the Democrats' new hoax to injure his presidency, he convinced many of his supporters that the virus was being exaggerated. 
Joe Azinski is a professor of political science and a conspiracy theory expert. We have found lots of evidence that people who trust him were less likely to take it seriously and more likely to believe in conspiracy theories. The truth is that when we are distracted by partisan fighting and finger pointing like we are during this crisis, we're in a worse position to respond to it. In general, misinformation is hard to spot. It is designed to look believable. A lot of the misinformation that we've seen starts with a kernel of truth and then has a whole bunch of lies kind of built on top of that. And that's a real issue because it looks credible when you first see it. Zoe Schiffer has tips on how to spot misinformation. Does it incite your emotions? Does it make you really mad or really fearful? Does it ask you to share with more people? Spread the message along, tell everyone you know. Those aren't really things that we hear from credible sources very often, but there are things we see in misinformation again and again. There are countless examples of misinformation circulating around the web. But while we are still living through this pandemic, there is one false narrative that is doing more damage than the rest. To this day, the notion that COVID-19 is being overhyped and is no worse than the seasonal flu is still being spread and is still shaping the behaviors of many Americans. We only need to listen to the frontline workers who've dealt with the disease firsthand to know the truth. Dr. Rafael Torres and Karen Binder worked in the emergency department in White Plains Hospital, less than 30 minutes north of New York City. It's impossible to imagine the impact of the virus until it's in your community, in your family, in your workplace. All the patients that you would see over four months with the regular flu season came at once. It was only about three weeks from having no patients to having a hospital full of patients with COVID. And it wasn't just people coming in with flu-like illnesses, it was people coming in with severe disease. Brittany Vufasisi works as an ICU nurse in the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan. Flu season is nothing compared to the coronavirus. It was so bad. From the middle of March to the middle of May, each day my patients were both coronavirus positive and I was with them for 12 hours a day. We were full all the time, unless there were deaths, unfortunately. The emergency department admitted a little over a thousand patients with COVID-19. There are people that never have any symptoms and there are people that have mild flu-like symptoms, but there's no way to know if you're gonna be one of those people until you get it. It's like a game of Russian roulette. There was such a randomness to it. We saw plenty of people in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s who became severely ill and who died. The youngest person we had that had passed was 32 and he didn't have any comorbidities. He didn't have any significant health history. With influenza, there are antivirals that you can use. And with this, you had no real effective treatments at this point. We were working in the dark from the beginning. The death rate is higher than we thought it was going to be. Our country's not as good as managing it as we thought it would be. Nobody still really completely understands this virus. Even today, there's new information coming out almost daily. In the end, we are all participants in this crisis, and the stories we tell each other will contribute to its final outcome. Where and how we get our information really does matter. The internet provides a way for people to share information very, very quickly. The internet has also allowed people to access authoritative, true information more so than has ever been done in the past. Now we can go right to the source. We can get real doctors, real science at our fingertips 24 hours a day that we can never do in the past. So when people allow themselves to fall prey to phony information, fake news sources, and to self-interested media outlets and politicians, they're setting themselves up to believe in wrong stuff. People do have a lot of responsibility to consume information responsibly and not to jump to conclusions based on whatever the last thing they saw on the internet was. Thank you.